Good evening, Crowsville First. How's everyone doing? Good. Actually, I decided, uh, you know, that um, actually with our first Bible study since, well, for the, you know, kind of uh, since of the summer or, well, actually the past two months, it's only supposed to be a month away from it, but it actually turned into two months because of rain, so, and then uh, today is hot. I was only outside for a little bit. I can't imagine you two. You guys better be careful out that way. Well, before we get into what we're going to, uh, we're going to be going through uh, tonight, I just, we're going to continue to pray for Nita, you know, in the, the spot that's on her lung, that that's nothing. They thought it was just a, a, scar, you know, a scar tissue before, but now all of a sudden, I guess they're saying that they think that it could be something else now. So that's why we're praying uh, for Nita. Lily Jackson. Lily, Lily Jackson? What's go, anything going on, or you just want to keep... All right. Yes. Yeah. Alicia is not here tonight because she is not feeling well. That's the reason why there's no first kids remix. Um, she says she doesn't feel like she's going, you know, like as far as like um, that she's going to be sick to her stomach or anything, but her stomach does not feel good anytime she moves and she does not want to move. So, <laughs> but she doesn't want to move because if she moves, then she doesn't feel well. So, yeah. I say that bubble wrap's got to be hot. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? We um, the, uh, today, uh, you know, be praying for the uh, elementary school students, especially, especially the ones over at Taven. Um, we we found out that there were kids that were not able to go to school because of the fact that they got. So overheated walking to school that they uh, got dehydrated and had, uh, you know, fevers. So uh, we heard about that. And so uh, what we did, you know, because, um, because of your faithfulness, we were able to go out and buy uh, umbrellas. So hopefully they're able to walk in the shade. Government does. I say government because it's not the school's fault. Schools only fell on what the government tells them. All right. They, uh, they say that they, if they miss so many days, if they don't, you know, if they are, Below, like 90% or below, they are no, they are not allowed to participate uh, participate in any kind of like fun cr- extracurricular activities. And I'm like, okay, so you have days where you have extreme heat, but you also have days where you have cold, and you have days to set aside for cold so people could stay home because you don't want anybody to freeze to death. But apparently, that's not the same for extreme heat. And so um, you have these ones, and they say, well, the ones over at Taven, they are within a mile, so they don't. Basically, they don't count for a bus uh, to go over there. So the parents are walking them over, kids are walking over. And like I said, it's not the school. I don't want you calling up, you know, Misty Ryan over there and be like, you know, how heartless are you? Because they are like at their wits end, you know, with that whole uh, situation. Um, but uh, like I say, just be praying for them because uh, we went over there and Denise, the uh, property manager over there, uh, you know, thanked us and everything else that we were able to do that. Um, and able to give it to the parents because, like I said, there's there's kids that are dehydrated and uh, having fevers now because they come home and they're meant for telling them that they have to do that kind of, you know. Yeah, they're not really letting them off for recess. And I know that they're letting the kids that walk, you know, go home first, but which I don't, I mean, it's you're still in the the heat of the day no matter which way you look at it and stuff, so... Hopefully uh, the days get cooler and they don't have to worry about that anymore, but I think that they should, I don't know, have something set aside for, you know, ones, I mean, yes, it's, and I, I actually took my truck out and said, I want to see how far it actually is from Taven to, you know, school, and it's like just under a mile, and it has to be, you know, over a mile to be considered, you know, for a bus, and so uh, kids should be able to go to school, you know, if, if they're not going to cancel school, they should be able to get a ride and not have to endure that kind of, you know, that kind of heat, because uh, I was out there periodically throughout the day, and I'm like, I'm just, I'm just walking from here to the store, and I'm like, you know, and it looks like I took a shower in my clothes. I mean, it's, you know, so it's, it's absolutely horrible. Any other prayer requests? Yeah, the weather as well, and also, the, you know, like I said, the, the kids and the parents, because the parents are, are taking them over there, you know, they're in 
All right, well, let's pray over these, and then we'll uh, get uh, in, into our Bible study. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we ask that, Lord, we ask that you would touch uh, Alicia as she um, is feeling out of the weather. Lord, we don't know uh, what's going on. I know that, I just know she does not feel well, and that it takes a lot for her to uh, stay home and not be able to be here uh, to, uh, to be with the kids. And so, Lord, we ask that you would touch her body, make her, her stomach and all of that uh, feel better, and she'll uh, be able to get, uh, you know, get back on her feet. Lord, we lift up Anita to you. Lord, we ask that this spot that's on her lung, Lord, it would just be what it, you know, what they thought it was originally, just scar tissue. And Lord, that it would be nothing, God. We ask that you would touch and heal her body, Lord. Lord, we lift up Chris Phelps as well, Lord, who, who on Sunday I know was not feeling well. So, Lord, we ask that you would heal and touch his body. Touch and heal Annie, Lord, of her, uh, Lord, of this, um, of her loss of sight, Lord. We ask that you would re return her sight to her. Lord, we lift up Lily Jackson to you, Lord, of uh, the stroke, Lord. We ask that you would, you would heal her, touch her, that she would have no um, ill effects from this, but she would be able to make a full and complete recovery. Lord, we lift up Marsha. We ask that she, uh, as she begins physical therapy and those things, Lord, we pray that she would be able to quickly recover. And Lord, since as well, Lord, be with them. Mother, Lord, would uh, subside uh, this heat. Lord, that you would protect the best to be able to... Uh, be able to provide an education for these uh, kids. And, uh, you know, and, and adding one more thing onto it of, of um, solutions, Lord, to their problems. Oh, God, they would have answers to their problems. In Jesus' name, amen. And so uh, what I want to talk to you tonight, I wanna, but there was uh, just a lot of things that happened. So, you know what, I'm going to revisit like 1 Timothy chapter 1 and then 2, and then we're going to get on into you know, I didn't remember because uh, that was a while ago, and so I like to actually be able to go continually through a book and not just, you know, do a part of a book and then stop and then wait a month or so and then start up again. And so we're going to uh, uh, go to... Miss Pat said this on Sunday, but somehow or another it didn't register with me, but she said that there were four kids that got saved on Sunday. And so that's an awesome thing, too, as well. So we've seen... Uh, we saw four kids get saved on Sunday, and then we had three, uh, three people get saved on Wednesday of last week. And then uh, Miss Mary, you know, was telling us that she, you know, led her granddaughter to the Lord. So that's eight people in a week. That's, that's an awesome thing to see, you know, uh, those people saved and, and uh, continue to, yep, yeah, that's, yeah, continue to recover from her surgery as well, uh, that she would have a quick and speedy recovery. Like I said, if you have your Bibles opened up to 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's read. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee uh, to abide still at Ephesus, uh, when, I, uh, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. Now the, now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart, and, an, and of a good conscience, and of a faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law is good, if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the uh, lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for uh, manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for manstealers, for liars, for, uh, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. According to the glorious gospel of the, of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me uh, for uh, that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly, exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is 
in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first, first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should uh, hereafter believe him to a life everlasting. But unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, but be glory and uh, sorry, be honor and glory forever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on, uh, before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good war, holding faith and a good conscience, Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, Lord, that our hearts would receive, Lord, the seed, uh, the seed upon the fertile soil of our hearts. Lord, I pray that your word would be as a fire shut up on my, uh, shut up on my bones. In First uh, Timothy, some of the, you know, the background for this book. So Paul writes this letter. He's writing this to his young protege, his, his uh, you know, to Timothy, providing instruction and encouragement for his ministry. And when he does this, obviously, he's, he's you know, for his ministry. So when he does this, he's saying, Timothy, you are, you are the pastor of this church, and this is how you should lead it. And he's, he's telling him, he says, you know what? You're a leader with sound doctrine, godly character, and proper leadership. That's how he wants Timothy to be able to do this. Uh, when, when Paul wrote this to Timothy, it is believed that it was right around 50 to 70 A.D. So this is, you know, obviously, um, right around 20 years or so after Christ, you know, has died and rose again, all right? And so Paul is, he's, he's raising up those behind him. Paul knows that, yes, he's able to, he's been preaching, you know, throughout the world, but he knows that no matter what, he has to appoint somebody to follow him. There has to be other ones. He has to grow other, other leaders out. And just like we, we read in Titus, Titus was one of his protégés as well, but Timothy is another one, and he not only writes Timothy the first time, but he writes him a second time because of those things that are going on. Paul, when he writes this as, you know, uh, uh, Timothy, where, sorry, where Timothy is at, he's a young pastor in Ephesus. So when he's in Ephesus, you know, that's where, like, when you read about Ephesus and the Ephesians, they're doing a lot of things that are not, you know, as believers, they're continuing on some of their pagan practices. Like, they are going out there, you know, this is where the Apostle Paul will go in, and he, uh, you, you read about in the book of Acts, where all these magic books and sorcery books are destroyed in Ephesus. This is where a lot of the central worship of, of Diana took place was in Ephesus. And this is, so where, this is where Timothy is getting ready to go be a pastor and go, uh, go do these things. You know, obviously Paul said that he, you know, that he wanted him to, him to stay with him in Macedonia, but Timothy, you know, just, he, went on to, uh, he went on to Ephesus to, to be able to preach the gospel there. And so he's giving him instructions, like I said, how to lead effectively. He's, he's warning Paul, or Paul's warning Timothy that you are going to run into false teachers. He said, they are going to come. If you are preaching sound doctrine, you're, pre, uh, you're teaching what the Bible says instead of just whatever, whoever you know, comes out and does, you will face false teachers. And the thing is, is that oftentimes we think that these false teachers are going to come out right away and say, hey, I'm a false teacher. They don't do that. And we know the false teachers, you know, the blatantly obvious ones like the Mormons, we know that. We know, you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. We know those ones. But the hard ones to figure out are the ones that, you know, it seems as though that they believe the same thing as we do. That will lead, you know, that can lead people to hell or astray. That as he said, they lost their, you know, their faith or their salvation, but the fact is they shipwrecked it. I mean, you think about it, when a boat is shipwrecked, it's, it's shipwrecked. It's still a boat. It's still there, possibly still able to, you know, to float. But is it any good when it's on land? No. He also encourages them, like I said, to remain faithful to the sound doctrine. Don't deviate from it. You know, sometimes people will come and church. Well, I heard pastor, he preached, you know, about this again. I, I remember last year he preached on it. There are some things in the church that need to be preached over and over and over again, like salvation. Those things need, and you say, well, you know, the thing is, is that if you've heard it once, you've heard it a thousand times, praise God that you're able to hear it a thousand times. 
And the thing is, is that, I mean, I don't ever get tired about, you know, reading the Bible and, and, and realizing that God saved me. I mean, that's an awesome thing, you know. And so he's saying, you know what, no matter who complains that they say, hey, you've been teaching this over and over again or you do this, you know what, keep doing it, keep preaching it. Because people need to be solid in the faith. Paul addresses that there are several issues in the church as well, such as the role of men and women. You know, um, and that's still something that goes on today because in the church nowadays, you have what I call a feminine, you know, there's the feminist movement that kind of changed everything. You know, all of a sudden in the 1960s, you know, ladies were, you know, burning their bras and that meant everything, you know, everything else changed, that the roles changed, you know, in America. It changed for the world. It still hasn't changed for what God's word says. Just because, you know, there's this ultra-feminist movement does not mean that it goes against God's word. And just because, you know, there's some people who say, well, you know, he's a male chauvinist pig. No. I understand that there are men out there, and, you know, and women or whatever, that take it to the extreme. You know, they say, you know, women should, you know, that, um, you know, that a woman should never speak in the house. Or what, I mean, there's some of these ones, or they'll, you know, some men will beat their wives and say, well, she didn't listen. This is not Islam, all right? But the thing is, the Bible is when you bring out, you know, bring out these things because they say, well, are, are you trying to say that there's a difference between a man and a woman? Yes, there is a difference between a man and a woman. I mean, you know, so, and there's also the fact for qualification for leaders and the care of widows. Paul, uh, you know, Paul's going to address these things and say, Timothy, you need to know these things. And some of those, like I said, overall themes you'll see over and over and over again, sound doctrine, leadership. He teaches on prayer, and he also teaches on conduct. And so what we, you know, as we go through this, we're, we're going to see these you know, points and see these moments here. But we'll, uh, you know, since he was a child, that his mom and his grandmother had taught him the Bible since he was a kid. Titus, they believe, was a, was a Greek that learned it later in life. Timothy uh, has known the Bible since he was a kid. And so um, that's what it says actually in the second letter to Timothy that it says, you know what, you had known this since you were a child. That Lois and Eunice, your mother and your grandmother, they taught you the Bible. They preached the Bible to you. You should know, you know, that you know this. And uh, so maybe that's the reason why, I don't know if that's the reason why he writes twice or, or whatnot, but that's the reason, uh, I mean, that's what we see uh, so far. And so let's look. At verses 1, one and 2, this is the greeting that Paul wrote uh, you know, to Timothy in this letter. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and uh, Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now think about that. Just that part right there. The fact is, is that he's writing it you know, to these ones. What does he say? He says, Jesus Christ, which is our hope. That right there should just be an amen right there, because the fact is, is that he is our only hope. We can't trust in these things, you know, we can't trust in the world. I mean, we see things are changing every single day. The world, you know, is changing their mind like they're changing, you know, a t-shirt. You know, they're, they're changing them over and over again. You know, they're just, you know, oh, that was yesterday. You know, this is a new thought that we have to have. And, you know, we got to do this. And, but God's word stands the same. And the thing is, is that because of that, he is our only hope. He is our only anchor because he's the only thing that's, that remains steadfast. That when everything else in life is going weird, or strange, or up the wall, you know, kind of like you see out there, we go to Christ, and you know what? He anchors us. He is our hope. Amen? Amen. So verse 2, you go on, it says, unto Timothy, my own son. Now, is this actually his own son? Like his blood son? No, this is not his own son. So when, when older men begin to mentor or teach other, you know, men to be pastors or to just encourage them in the faith, Paul, you know, you know, takes it as, you know what, I'm teaching my own son. That this is my son. This is not like, oh, well, you know what, you're, you're my church son. And I have this other one. No, he goes on and says, you know what, you are my son. And the thing is, is that the old saying where it says blood runs thicker than water is not true. We like to think that our family will stand by our side. But how many of us know the fact is, is that especially when we gave our life to Christ, when we became a believer, we had family that turned their back on us and said, I don't want anything to do with you. They don't. I mean, I, you know, like I said, you know, I, I told you a story where, you know, where I know a man who stood up for his faith, you know, was a you know, believer, and his wife came to him and said, it is either me or Jesus. 
And this person, you know, like I said, had told, you know, just, you know, told me, said, you know, I love my wife more now. And he says, and I told this to her, I love her now more than I ever have. Even though, you know, people say, well, how is that possible? You know, she's a non-believer. Well, it is. Because Christ, when he comes in, shows you who they really are and their need for him. And so he, he said, he told her, he said, you know, I love you now more than I ever have. But if you put it that way, I, I, basically, he says, I, I choose Christ, but I love you. I want to stay with you. She says, I don't want anything to do with you. You would think, I mean, it, I mean that's almost like a hallmark moment, isn't it? So the saying of saying, you know what? I love you now more than I ever have. That's like a you know, romantic movie that everybody goes, oh. But instead of that, you have the plot twist. be like, sorry, no, I don't, uh, you know what? I'm done with you. It's like the anti, you know, uh, the anti-romantic, you know, movie, you know, of like, I love you now more than I ever have. No, I don't like you anymore. I mean, just, you know, that kind of thing. But anyways, we go on in here. It says, like, it says, uh, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And so that's how we should, you know, be, you know, praying because the thing is, we all need God's grace. We need His mercy and we need His peace. And we should be praying that for every believer. When we sit down and we're praying for people, it's family, you know, for saved people, whether it's family, friends, whoever, if they are believers, we should be praying that God's grace, that God would continue to show them grace because we all need God's grace, amen? I mean, if it wasn't for God's grace, none of us would be here. We definitely need his mercy because, you know what, it's, yeah, yeah. And then definitely need his peace. In a world that is, you know, heavy with turmoil and everything else changing, we need God's peace. So let's look at, um, ver- uh, we're going to see in the next, uh, in verses 3 through 11, that we are, t- you know, the correcting of false teachers. We're going to see the correcting of false teachers. And, it says, and, uh, and Paul says this, he says, As I besought thee to, uh, to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia. So he, 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 wanted, he wanted him to stay there while he went off to Macedonia. I think I said that backwards earlier. Um, but that's what it says right there. It says, and that thou mightest charge some that they should teach no other doctrine. So the doctrine that Paul had taught them, he's saying, you know what, stay to that. Stick to sound doctrine because there's other ones. He says, you know what, and I, and I told the ones while I was there not to teach any sound doctrine than this. And yet, he's hoping, you know, it sounds like he's hoping that they would stay faithful to that, that they would not teach false doctrine. And he goes on and labels what this false, uh, some of this false doctrine is. So, so do. So if we look at this, we can figure out immediately who this is that he's speaking of. Because how, all about the fact of they were born into something that they had no choice. That they're all about that they, they are God's chosen people into the Old Testament. They go back, I mean, we see this, you know, with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they'll sit there and go, well, you know what, we are of Abraham. That's, they're, they're referring back to their genealogy. Oh, you know, we believe the prophet Moses, and they'll go on and say all these things. So who is he referring to? He's referring to the Jews. The Jews will come out and say, you know what, I mean, the Bible says, you know, that, that they hate Jesus Christ. They hate the son, and it's, the Bible says that if you don't have the son, you don't have the father. And if, if you don't have the, uh, you know, the, um, and if you don't have, sorry, if you don't have the father, then you don't have the son. I mean, you deny if you deny one, you're going to deny the other. So if you deny the, the fact that you have the son of God, you're going to deny the father, and that's actually what they do. Most, the vast majority of Jewish people don't believe the Old Testament. They believe the Old Testament to be myths and fairy tales. They won't even tell you that. If you weren't into a Jew, I mean, I'm not saying all of them, but most of them, that's what they believe. They believe that's a good, you know, children's fable. So that's what they, and they will go to that, and they, what they believe is they, they, uh, they believe the rabbinical teachings. And we see this in the New Testament. We see this with the Pharisees and the rabbis because they talk about the traditions of the rabbis. They talk about different traditions that they have. And those same traditions, I believe, are today, which is the Talmud. The Talmud is a, is a 30 volume, like, if it, I mean, it would probably from this speaker, you know, end of that speaker to this speaker, that's like how, like 30 volumes. I mean, it's, it's substantial. And most, you know, Jewish people say that they've only read a couple of them. They haven't read all of it. But inside of this Talmud is, 
is the fact that they refer to Jesus as being the illegitimate son of Mary or the bastard son of Mary. That's actually how they say it. And they actually, you know, talk about, you know, that um, about Jesus as being like dung in their mouth. I mean, just all these wicked things about Christ. You should, I mean, maybe, you know, next week I'll bring in the fact of what they say about the Gentiles. You know, Gentiles are anybody that is not Jewish. So this is how they would actually feel about you and I. All right? And it's, you know what, if you thought the stuff about Jesus is, you know, bad, you know, just, like I said, I'll, I'll see if I can find, you know, find the stuff that I was reading about it. And it's, you'll sit there and be like, man, they don't like me at all. I mean, they, they look at you as being like, if there's like pond scum, like there's scum under a rock, and then other, like you're like about five, six layers underneath that. I mean, just, they don't, they don't like any Gentiles. You're, you are unclean and dirty to them. And so, but anyways, this is what he's talking about. He says, you know what, don't give heed to these things, these fables that they, you know, these talk, they talk about all these weird things because they'll even talk about like the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is something that, and I'm, and I'm getting a little off track, you know, trail, but I want to go here. The book now, the book of Enoch now should be included in the Bible. It should not be. They talk about the fact of like stars turning into babies. It talks about 450 foot high, you know, giants. The Bible never refers to any giants and go, oh, that's the Nephilim or the, you know, or the sons of God back in Genesis. I believe the Bible tells us who the giants are. It refers to Goliath as a giant, okay? This is the only time in the Bible that you will actually see that there is a measurement for what they, uh, the Bible calls a giant. And what... If you look at it, it's anywhere from, you know, the, his bed was about 13 feet. Oh, that's still a tall guy, I'll tell you that. Because I have a friend of mine who's six foot seven, and like, I feel like I'm a toddler standing next to him. And there's other guys that are out there. I mean, I, think the, I believe the, world record, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records has, uh, has it at that the tallest man in the world was nine foot one. So this is not out of the realm of possibility, but the 425-foot ogres that you see in Lord of the Rings and everything else is not true, okay? That's called, a, that's called fiction. That's a, you know, it's a fantasy book, you know? And we're not supposed to be, you know, going off of that. But what does he say? He says, because all these things, what is this going to do? Fables? I had a guy, a pastor come up and says, hey, you know what? I think you should go get a DNA test, you know, just to see who you are in your past. I said, I don't want to, I don't care who's in my past. I said, for one thing, how do they know who's in my past? Besides maybe a couple generations. And they said, well, well they, they do it this way and they whatever. I said, I can guarantee you that when you did it, somebody famous came up, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. Common people and peasants. They want you to think, oh, yeah. And that way you keep looking further into it and you keep on paying them more money. But I could care less. You know why? Because you, you know, where my, you know where, where my genealogy ends up? Christ. That's all that's important, is the fact that, you know what, I was a wicked sinner apart from Christ, and I'm a sinner now, but the thing is that I'm saved by grace. Amen. That's all that matters. I don't care. I don't care. And we shouldn't care, you know, you know what our nationality, people coming up and say, well, what ethnicity are you? I'll tell you, I'm Italian, German, and English. What does that mean? Nothing. You know, but I'm a Bible-believing Christian. What does that mean? A whole lot. Because all this other stuff about your skin color and all that does not matter. Because the Bible, you know, the Bible says that he is no respecter of per persons. He does not play favorites. You know what? We're all equal in, in his sight. The thing is, as the song says, and Miss Pat will know this, red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. Amen? So this part right here is, you know, and as I'm going here, I might only get done with the, you know, only the, the first half of the chapter here, the way I'm going. Let's look at verse 5. It says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. That word charity is different than love. A lot of people say, well, love is deeper. No, charity is. Because charity is something that you're doing you know, out of yourself no matter whether the person gives you a thank you or not, whether or not you see them again or not. The fact is, is that you go over and you give them something. I mean, think about it. You got, you know, like I said earlier, because you guys are faithful to giving, we were able to give umbrellas. Do I know who they, which person they gave them to? No, I know they live over in Taven, but I have no idea who got an umbrella. That's what you call charity. 
because you want to do something because they're a person, and you know what, and you want to be, you know, and you want to, out of a pure heart and a good conscience, do something for them. That's what it is. And when we preach the gospel to someone, we're doing that same thing. Because we're not being a respecter of persons, we're sharing the gospel with everybody. Amen? Let's look at verse 6. It says, From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. That's not a term that we oftentimes you know, hear nowadays, vain jangling. So what is that? That's like a, a quarreling. It's a, it's a noisy dispute. It's you know, basically they're arguing over these things. That's the reason why he's saying, you know what? Don't, you know, don't give into these fables, these fairy, uh, fairy tales and these genealogies, because all this is going to end in is you're going to have you know, a disagreement and an argument. It says people have turned aside from the, you know, turned aside because they want to argue. And there are some people in life that no matter what you say, no matter what you do, they want to argue. Like, their day could be going wonderful, and they're like, you know what, it's not a good day yet, I need to argue. I mean, there are some that are out there that until the day is over, they must have an argument. And that's what, you know, he's talking about, he says, don't do that. Because, you know, he says, you're basically, you're deterring not only... You're getting off on the wrong path, but you're also uh, causing others to turn you know, from the faith because they're like, you're just acting like everybody else. Verse 7, neither what they say nor what of, them, uh, what of them they affirm, or where of them they affirm. And so when we look at that, it says they're desiring to be teachers of the law. They're desiring to teach God's word. Have you ever met somebody that they got up and they started preaching and you're going, I have no idea what they're talking about. I have, and you walk out, and they're like, somebody goes, oh, that's great. And you're going, I have no idea what that was. Or I've been, met a person that says, you know, that was a good sermon, but the scripture that they used were, was wrong because th- that scripture was not talking about that. That's why you've got to look at context and everything else because there's so many people, so many religions out there that will isolate a verse and make it say whatever they want it to say. I mean, like I said, that's where you get the you know, Mormons saying that you know, women should be, you know, only can be saved through childbearing. That's why you've got to have a lot of kids. Because they isolated one verse instead of taking the whole context of it. And they, they do that and they have you know, millions of people that are going to hell because of them and that lie. Let's go on to verse 8. It says, and by the way, he says, you know what? They shouldn't be teaching in the first place, these people. Because it says, um, you know, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm they don't even know what they're talking about. Verse 8, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So who is the law for? Verse 9 says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the, law, uh, for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for manstealers, uh, for liars, for perjured, uh, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So he goes through this entire thing and says, who is it for? It's, he says, basically, it's not necessarily for the saved person because the whole point of the law is to point somebody to Christ. And if you're a saved person, you've already been pointed to Christ. He's not saying that all of a sudden, you know, you don't have to follow what the law says. You know, because there's obviously good things in there, like, you know, the fact that we should. Why, when we go out knocking door to door, we go soul winning. I will bring up certain, you know, parts of it, and I'll bring up the law. Why? To show them that they need Christ. Because that's what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to show their need for Christ. And so, when we do that, but the thing is, is that he goes through this entire list, and so... If somebody says, well, that's not me, I mean, the fact that if a person says that they've never lied before, because it says four liars, you're lying. But he even goes a step further, because look, look at the next part, it says, and if there be, if it goes against what I, you know, goes against what God's word says, that too. Just in case I forgot something. And so verse 11 says, according to the glorious gospel, when we got saved, the gospel is committed to our trust. It's been committed to your trust. That means, you know what? It's in your case. It was preached to me. That's, uh, that's committed to my trust, and I need to do with it what God has asked me to do with it. The same thing goes for Because why? Because it's been committed to our trust. We are to be faithful in that, right? And so, but we see the fact of this whole entire thing so far is these, you know, the fact that you're know, correcting false teachers and their heresies and everything else and all that. But Paul then goes on in the next, you know, five or six verses 
He talks about the grace of God shown to him. Because he wants people to realize that Paul knows you know, where, he, you know, where God has brought him from. And we can't forget the fact of where God has brought us. We can't forget that. I mean, I think, you know, there's times where I say, you know what, I mean, I was just telling somebody, you know, today, you know, uh, about what I used to do, not for, you know, glory's sake, but the fact is, you know, to let people know, hey, you know what, I was just like you. And, there, and I'm, not, I'm still not perfect, so I'm not saying that, you know, like I'm so much better than you because God's still working on me. I'm saying this is what I used to do. God saved me, you know, saved me, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm progressing, you know, in that before I got saved. I didn't smoke cigarettes. I didn't, you know, marijuana, nothing in my floor. And for something in my mind made me think of that. I don't know why, but I just never did. I just said, no, I don't want to do it. And when I said, but my thing was before that, I said, I was a drinker. I said, I like to drink. And there was different, you know, different ones that I liked. The thing was is that, the weird thing was the fact that I liked, liked the harder stuff. Because I figured the harder the stuff, you know, the better it has to be. And yeah, it burned down the first couple times, but after, the, you know, after you got past the first couple times, it didn't burn quite as much. And I say all that, you know, to go, man, how stupid was I? You know, how, 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 how much, you know, in my own self was I, that, you know, to sit there and you know, that I was ignorant, you know, to sit there and think that, that somehow that was a good thing. You know, to go out, party, and drink, and do all those things. It wasn't. It was not a good thing. I don't say that, you know, you know for you to go, wow, pastor did that. No, I say that because, you know, to my, to my shame that I did those things. And the fact is, is that I also glory in it because of the fact that that's what Christ brought me through. Amen. Let's look at it. It says, uh, let's read those next uh, 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 verses uh, 12 through 17. It says this, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me uh, for that uh, a persecutor and injurious, but I attained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful say, a saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit uh, for this cause I attain mercy, that in me first Christ might, uh, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. I, think, I, I sat there and I think, I was like, man, is he reading what he brought me through? Because I, I look at the you know, things he says, you know, the fact that he counted me faithful and put me in ministry. You say, well, pastor, I'm not preaching from a pulpit. Everybody has ministry. Someone, you know, it varies in different areas. But everybody's in ministry somewhere. No matter, you know, if you're, you know, working at a fast food, a fast food place, you're, you're putting, you know, houses back together that people have destroyed. Um, I say people, not, you know, storms or anything else. They, they destroyed them. Or the fact, you know, you, you, you know, uh, you work, you know, at a, at the do uh, eye doctor's office or, you know, those different things, you know, all those things, those are areas of ministry. Why? Because you know what? I have this ability to be able to talk to people here, but you aware. So it says it right in here. The fact that, and my brother and I were just talking about this the other day, the fact that God uses us to preach the gospel so somebody else can get saved. Do you not think that's weird? That, that the fact that God says, you know what? I know that you're, I know that you're gonna mess up next week. I know you do all, but you know what? I'm gonna use you to get somebody saved. My brother and I were sitting, I was like, man, I said, you know, I, I just look at myself and I'm going, why would you do that? But it's like God says, you know what? I'm gonna use you and somebody to the Lord or brought somebody to the Lord or seen somebody saved. It's an amazing feeling. And I sit there and go, why did you use me to reach them? Why? I mean, it just, I don't know, it just doesn't make sense to me. I just, you know, I just say, you know, forget it. I'm not going to try to make sense of it. I'm just going to go ahead and do what he says to do. You know, that's just, that's all there is, to, you know, that I can go about it. But, I mean, I know that Miss Pat on Sunday, she was beaming. I mean, the fact that there was up the room, I'll tell you that right now. She was excited about that. And when I heard that, I was excited. When I get a phone, like I said, this past, you know, it took everything inside of me not to, like, start, like, yelling inside of, like, the roundhouse because I was so excited for her. And she was apologizing because she's like, I, don't, I didn't do it the way that you do it. I said, it don't matter. Somebody, you know, you know and somebody's in that way. 
He goes on, you know, uh, until, you know, just, you know, for the you know, fact of where he came from. He said, was, I was a blasphemer. A blasphemer is somebody that does things against God. They argue against God. I mean, he was going around killing people and having people persecuted because they were Christians. And then he goes on, he says, I persecuted, you know, I was a persecutor. Or, you know, he says, I persecuted people. I, I injured people. I hurt them. He says, but I attained mercy. He says that if we were to look at, you know, the Apostle Paul or any of our lives, the Bible says, you know, forgive as you have been forgiven. How have you been forgiven? Have you been forgiven much by Christ? The fact that you're not going to hell, that means you're forgiven quite a bit. And over again is amazing. It's an amazing thing. It says, but I attain mercy because I did it ignorantly in disbelief. There's, there's stuff that we do out of ignorance. I mean, it's, it, you know, there's still that ignorance that we have, but the thing is that God shows us mercy. I mean, I mean, there's nothing really more you can go on there and say than Paul. So the ones that believe in, um, you know, in this whole thing that some are you know, predestined to hell before the foundation of the world and some are predestined to heaven and that, you know, some are doomed from the womb, as they say it. Like I said, you know, uh, you know is it uh, body, uh, body or body, uh, you know, uh, Beckham or, or Berkham or something like that, you know, big, you know, big Calvinist preacher, John Piper and all these other ones. But this guy, you know, Vadi said that if they could, a child, a baby would kill you in their sleep. How can you have such a wicked view of children? Did they say that, that a baby, if they had the ability that they, would, that they would kill you in your sleep? I mean, wow. But the fact is, is that how do they get past the verse that says that Christ came into the world to save sinners? And they will, they will re, restate this and they'll say, well, when he means, what, you know, it's not for those that are predestined to hell. He's talking about the elect here. And they'll try and like, no, it says that he came into the world to save sinners. The world means the world. It means everyone. And he says, of whom I'm chief. He's like, I'm the chief of all sinners. That's how Paul still views himself. He says, you know what? I did all these wicked things. I am the chief. I am, you know. He has a proper perspective of where he came from. He knows where he was before he got saved, and he knows where he is now. He's not saying that, you know, sinners, because you know what? This is what I did. And I, you know what? In God's verses, we're going to see the fact, uh, we're going to see, um, actually, sorry, before I go there, I just want to point out the latter part of verse 16 which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So he's saying, you know what? You believe he came to save. Now let's look at the, uh, the, final, the, the final verses. Um, Admit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that, uh, thou, by, thou, that thou by them mightest war have made shipwreck of whom is uh, Hamaeus and uh, Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they, may not, uh, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so when we look at these final verses, this is the final chart. I'm committing, I'm putting in your trust, this is what you do, that you know, those things that, you know, that people saw on you, you know, that you know, prayed over you, this is what's going to happen. And the fact is, is that in verse 18, that he uses this language should have you realize what ministry of them mightest war a good warfare. The fact is, is that he's saying it's going to be a war. We know this from Ephesians. He, you know, talks about that there's, that, that, you know, that, that there, you know, there's, there's war, a war going on in the heavenlies and there's wars going on. He says, you know what? It's going to be a battle. I said this on Sunday and it, it is hard. Paul, uh, Paul is telling Timothy it's a war. That when you go out there, you're going to war not only against your own flesh because your flesh wants to do what it wants to do, but you're going to have other people that are going to war against you as well. Family, friends. He says, you know, that you war a good warfare. That when you go out there, realize that it's the fact of, you know, they're, you know, they're being influenced because, you know what, if they're not saved, or even if they are saved, there are sometimes that people, it's sad to say that there are churches out there that will fight other Christians because they don't like what's going on. My thing is, is that, you know, I've, I've had people come up and, and uh, um, you know, uh, like pastors wanting to 
and these are, you know, false pastors that I'm referring to, but they'll come up and they will say everything nice to your face, but they'll talk behind you, behind your back. There's a pastor here in town, and actually I'm going to, you know, tell you exactly who it was that did this. It's been seven years. I've kept my mouth shut for seven years. I'm going to say it tonight who it is, because the Bible says to mark them that are doing these things, that are, you know, these false teachers, and that's Richard Lee over at Jesus Name Tabernacle. When we first got here, that man um, ran our name through the mug, said, said that we were teaching, preaching a false gospel, telling all his, you know, all of his congregation that we are heretics and all this. He's a heretic. He's the one who, t- uh, who, who teaches that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. You've got to speak in tongues in order to be saved, that you've got to do all these other things. He's a heretic, and he's on his way to hell. I've talked to him. I know, who, you know who he is. And the fact is, it's not just that. The fact is, is that when we first got here, and us, that man is a, you know, you know, is a false prophet and a false teacher, and I don't have a problem saying it, because you know, I've talked to him, and he will come out to me, hey, how are you doing, man, how are you, whatever, and then talk behind my back. I know he has, because I've had people come up to me and tell me that he has. I've had people you know, screenshot stuff from Facebook saying that this is what he's saying about me. And about my wife. And about our church. He's a heretic. He's a false prophet. And I'll say it again. Richard Lee is a false prophet. He is a false teacher. He is sending people to hell. Because he's teaching this false gospel that it's not just believe on. He'll say, oh yes, it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to be baptized to be saved. You need to speak in tongues to be saved. Where does that say that in the Bible? That's a damnable heresy. That's a, fa- you know, that's a false teacher and a false prophet. And the fact is, is that he wants to come out in his fake religious, you know, re- religiosity. And you say, you know, I'm tired of like sitting there and trying to like pull punches and stuff like that. A lot of this stuff, you know, there's more other people and stuff like that, you know, that are false teachers because you know, he's adding to the gospel. I have heard him get up there and basically poke and prod and do all kinds of things to get more money from his congregation. He's all about the fact of, you know, what people think of him and say about him and everything else. That's what he is. He wants his treasure here, and he's going to get it. That's what he's going to get. That's all he's going to get. If he, don't, you know, if he doesn't, you know, if he doesn't get saved, problem with that and say, Pastor, why would you say that? The Bible says to mark them that do these things. Go into the fact about um, oneness Pentecostals as being a false religion, because it is. And the fact that, you know, that, that they don't believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they believe that there's one. They go, oh, we just believe in one, in Jesus' name only. That's why. There's the fact that Jesus is schizophrenic. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. He changes modes, as they call it. That Jesus, all of a sudden, he changes modes, and all of a sudden, he's like, oh, I'm not Jesus anymore. I'm the Father. Oh, wait, no, no, now I'm the Holy Spirit. Oh, wait, uh, who am I again? I mean, that's what they teach. Oh, repent and be baptized. That's where it means. That's how you get saved. Now, did you ever think that the, uh, you know, the fact that it says repent and be baptized literally means, that's what it means. But no, he went, oh, well, that's what it means. You've got to repent and you've got to be baptized. Not only in water, but in, you've got to speak in tongues too. It's all this, you know, like false teaching. What if you were to call me tomorrow and say, why did you do seven years? It's about going out knocking door to door and, and, and soul winning. I've, I've seen more, we've seen more people that, you know, saved from his church. We're seeing people saved from his church because, you know what, he doesn't talk about salvation. He doesn't preach salvation. He preaches a damnable heresy. And then the, the thing is, is that it's amazing. A lot of them still go over to that church because they're still duped by him. But the thing is, at least they're on the way to heaven. At least they got saved. But that's a sad thing when your own congregation, I've asked them. I come to their door and just say, Here's, have no idea how to get saved. How is that possible? That's a problem. The last two verses where he talks about this is, you know, uh, holding faith and, and a good conscience, but he, what, what did he go correct? They're not doing what they're, you know, supposed to do. They're not all like, like to the fact that Jesus said that he is the living water. The fact is that we're, because what, you, what good use is a boat that's on a trailer? What, what good use is it? It's not being, you know, traveled with them. He says, whom I have delivered unto Satan. He's not saying that they're not saved. He said, I gave them to Satan. He says that they, who did all the stuff to Job? Satan. Who allowed it? 
Paul is talking about these two. He's saying, you know what? I'm letting basically Satan deal with them so that they'll learn not to blaspheme, you know, not to take God's name in vain and do all these bad things. A rebuke in their life so that way they would come back you know, to, the, to the solid truth. Because you have some people that will sit there and keep doing it and everything else, and so what needs to happen is for them to, um, to be delivered mistake. It's kind of like when, uh, you know, when Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's God will use Satan to chasten you. If we are doing things that we are not supposed to do, God will, you know, God will do things. He'll, he'll send Satan. He'll send people. He'll do all these things to get you, to do, uh, to get you back where you need to be. And when he says, you know, like I said, delivered them unto Satan does not mean the person's not saved. It just means the fact that he's like, hey, you know what, I'm u- uh, using Satan so that way hopefully you'll come back to, you know, you'll come back to your senses. You can refer to this as the uh, two by four across your head sometimes that you need, you know, that God needs to smack you around or something like that, you know. Or, you know, you can call it Satan, whichever you want to. But God will use different things around your life. Amen? You guys have any questions about that? I went off on a little tangent tonight, but... Any, uh, any questions about it? God, I thank you for the, you know, this letter that was written to uh, Timothy from Paul about how a pastor should, you know, should teach, uh, to teach and preach his church and how to, how to lead his church to be a great example to those that he is preaching that word to. And so, Lord, I, 